Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Get Ready for Game Night, my YouTube channel where I try to teach you how to play some of my favorite games in a casual, unscripted manner. Tonight, I'm going to teach you how to play the game Twa by Sebastian Desjardins, Xavier Georget, and Alain Orban. I butchered all those names. But anyway, let's get ready for game night. In the game of Twa, you're representing a rich or nobility-style family from the Champagne region of France. Um... And throughout the course of the game, which represents, I believe, uh, several hundred years, you're going to use your influence to recruit and supervise individuals or workers uh, represented by the dice to carry out various actions to help develop the city of Troyes and to fend off uh, invaders and bad things that may happen. Uh, the amount of rounds in the game and the amount of dice you get to start with is variable depending on player count. I'll let you look that up in the instructions on your own. But basically, you're going to score points for doing several things. First of all, you're going to be building the cathedral up here. You're going to be fending off bad event cards that happen. You're going to be sending your citizens, which are these meeples, to three principal houses. The uh, palace the bishopric, which is basically the church, and the town hall, which represents the uh, city uh, civil type actions. Whenever you have one of your meeples in one of these principal buildings, you're going to get to roll a corresponding die. Red for the palace, white for the bishopric, and yellow for the city hall. You'll be rolling these dice and then using those dice to take all of these actions. Other ways you're going to score points during the game is uh, everyone is going to score points at the end based on some secret objective cards that everyone will receive. Now, everyone gets their own secret objective card. For instance, this card says that you'll score victory points based on how much influence you have at the end of the game, whereas this card says that you'll score victory points based on how many of your citizens are in the three principal buildings. The interesting thing is that these cards are secret. Whoever has this card knows that that is an endgame scoring condition, but these are endgame scoring conditions for all players. So every other player in the game will have their own endgame scoring condition that applies to you and your end game scoring condition applies to everyone. So part of the game is trying to suss out what everyone else's end game scoring condition card says so that you can maximize your opportunity to win. The game comes with some really nice player aids that walk you through step by step what happens in every phase. And I think just going through how all these work is probably the best way for you to learn how to play. So we start with revealing activity cards. Let's see what that means. All three principal buildings of the game have these locations directly either below or above them in the case of the bishopric. But these are areas where additional actions are going to be revealed. Now, there are a lot of cards in this game, but you very, use very few of them. Uh, these are all of the red cards that come in the game. And you'll notice they have ones, twos, and threes printed on them. As part of setup, you're going to shuffle each deck, select just one card of each type, and place it in the respective areas on the game board. All the rest of these cards are not used and put back in the box. At the beginning of the first, second, and third round of the game, what happens is that the lowest numbered activity card that is not flipped over is revealed. So at the beginning of the game, you'll have one revealed activity card in each of the three principal buildings. As I said, these activity cards allow you to take very specific actions in the game that are unique to that particular activity card. The next phase is income and salaries. For every round of the game, every player will receive 10 money, or denaries as they're called in this game, but then you also have to pay for all of your citizens. Now, the amount you have to pay depends on where that citizen is. 
So if we grab some citizens for the green player, and maybe he has a couple of citizens in the palace, as well as a couple of citizens up in the bishopric, and maybe he has one citizen that we'll put off camera over in the town hall. You can see by looking above each location how much each citizen costs. In, for example, here in the palace, every citizen costs you $2. Every citizen up here in the bishopric costs you $1. And as I pan over, you can see that there is no cost for having a citizen in the town hall. So, in this example, after receiving your $10 income, you would then have to pay two, four, five, six of it back. So, you would start this round by receiving four denarius. Phase two of every round is assembling your workforce. What that means is, for every citizen that you have in a given principal building, you would gather one die of that color. So in this case, the green player would grab two red dice, two yellow dice, and one yellow die. After assembling the appropriate dice, you would give them a roll, and then put them in your player area. Your player area is here in the center of the board, and it's denoted by your colored dowel being in the middle. It doesn't matter which area is yours, I highly recommend you just choose an area that is closest to where you're sitting around the board. Now you've assembled your workforce, these are the workers you'll use to carry out actions during the round. But before you can start taking actions, phase three says that we have to have some events. Events are things that are always bad for everybody, but they do represent opportunities to gain some victory points as well as some influence. So when it comes to the event phase, it says to reveal two event cards. Now the first event card is always one of these red-backed event cards. You'd simply take the entire stack of red-backed event cards, give it a shuffle at the start of the game, and then reveal one red event card. At the bottom of this card, it will tell you whether to add a yellow event card or a white event card as the second event. In this case, it says to add a white event card. So we would take a white event card, reveal that, and that is the second event card revealed for this round. As the event cards are revealed, we have to deal with them right away. So first we note that at the bottom of these event cards, some of them have black dice. Now this first spot here that says marauding, this is a permanent thing on the board. This will never go away, and it will always add at least one black die to the pool. These black dice basically represent some type of uh, armed conflict that the city has to deal with. We see that this card, called War, says to add two more black dice to our pool. And this final card, Heresy, doesn't add any black dice. Great. Well, now we have to take the cards from left to right and any cards that don't add black dice, we have to resolve them. In this case, the heresy card has two crosses through two little flag symbols. These flag symbols represent influence, which is one of the primary currencies of the game. You will use influence to get more workers and modify your die results, and so having a lot of it is really good. This card says that every player in the game must now lose two influence. Across the top of the board, you can see the influence track, where you'll have your discs. According to the card, all of these discs would have to be shifted down two positions. Alternatively, if you go on BoardGameGeek, a very, very creative and talented user has posted files for these player mats for Twa, which I've downloaded and just printed on some really light cardstock, and that way everyone can track their influence across the top of their own individual track, which I like to do using these cubes because the discs kind of are a little big for this particular track. I'll try to put a link in the description of this video as to where you can print these out yourself. But how do we deal with these black dice? Well, whoever the start player is will then have to take all the black dice, which represent some type of invasion or armed conflict, and roll them. 
And now every player, starting with the start player and then proceeding in clockwise order, has to deal with these dice. And here's how you deal with them. Let's suppose that this is the dice pool that the start player had rolled. Well, and we'll zoom in just a little bit here. The start player has to take the highest numbered die that was rolled among the black dice, in this case a four. They have to counter the pips on that die with an equal number of pips from their own dice. So they could use this white and this yellow die to counter it, in which case these dice would be discarded and used up for the round. But a better way to do it is the fact that red dice, when used for countering invader, invaders, are always doubled. That's because the red dice basically represent military actions. So this red two would counter this black four. Both dice would be discarded, and then you would go to the next player in clockwise order, and they would have to deal with the next highest die that remains from their dice pool. Now, you may opt to deal with more than just one die when it's your turn. For example, if this player used both the three, which counts as six, and the two that counts as four, well, that would have 10 points that he could counter. So he could actually counter all three of these black dice with just these two red ones. Or maybe he only wants to deal with five points worth of black dice, which he could absolutely do with, say, this six all by itself. So by using a single red die, because remember it's doubled, so that's worth six points, he could counter both of these dice, because after you've dealt with the highest one, you can optionally deal with any other remaining dice. Well, why would you do that? Well, for every die that you counter during this phase of the game, you are going to gain one influence. But what happens if, for example, you just rolled really, really poorly, and maybe you didn't have as many red dice as you had hoped? Well, there are two options. First, if you don't have the appropriate dice to counter even a single die in the black dice pool, you can just say, I can't deal with these and lose two victory points. Probably not smart. The other option is you can spend your influence to manipulate the dice. Now, everyone on the back side of their player aid has this reference chart that tells you how you can spend influence. For example, you can spend one influence to re-roll a die. So maybe this red one isn't so hot, you lose one influence from your player chart. Well, that's not great. Hey, I would cost me two influence to roll it twice, but now it's a five, so that's 10 points worth of military. The other thing you can do is for four influence, you can pick up to three of your own dice and flip them to their opposite side. Friendly reminder, if you're not aware of this, the opposite sides of dice always add up to seven. So this one would flip to a six and both of these twos would flip to fives. All of a sudden, you have much better dice to deal with. Now that you're done with the events phase, you can get to the meat of the game, which is taking actions. So to take an action, when it is your turn, you will simply choose any number of your dice, usually of a single color, and then take one of the standard actions. So what are those actions? Well, first of all, you could activate one of the activity cards that has been revealed. Now, before you can activate an activity card, you must have one of your citizens on that card. Well, at the beginning of the game, all of your citizens are gonna be up in the principal buildings. So there's two ways you can get your citizen on this card. First of all, you could just abandon one of the principal buildings to get your citizen down on top of the card and you would place it there. 
But more likely, you're just going to hire a new citizen by spending influence. If we look at our reference card again, remember one thing that you can do with influence is spend two of it to gain a new citizen, which is what most likely you're gonna to wanna to do. So you would reduce your influence by two, you now have a new citizen, and you can place it on this card. However, there is a cost associated with that. If you look right here, you can see to place your citizen on this card, it will cost you $6. Now, if your citizen is still there at the end of the game, because there are ways to displace these citizens, that'll be worth two victory points to you. So once your citizen is on that card, you can then use dice to activate the card. Placing your citizen there and spending the two influence to get that new citizen is completely free. That does not consume your action. But activating the card does. So let's take a closer look at the card to see how activating them work. So to activate this card, you'll see from the iconography here that you can only use red dice to activate the card. As a general rule, you will need red dice to activate the red cards, yellow for the yellow, white for the white. You can assemble a group of dice from one to three, and all the groups of dice for this purpose throughout the entire game will always be one to three, and add their pip values up. You would then divide that pip value by four in this case, but all the cards will have their own denominators, and whatever that resulting fraction is, that's how many times you can activate the card, always rounding down. So, for example, if you had a five and a five, and you wanted to activate this card, you have 10 divided by four, you can activate this card twice. Any remainders are just lost. And that is basically how all the cards are going to work in terms of how many activations you get of the card. Now, as to what the cards specifically do, as you saw in the beginning, it's wildly varied and it's gonna be different for every game. So I won't explain all of them, but let's just take a look at what this card in particular does. This card is called Chivalry. And when you activate it, you get to place a cube on an event card for each red die in your district, excluding the red dice you used to activate this card. So what does that mean? Well, let's phase down to our event cards again. Now these event cards are gonna happen every single round until we get rid of them. And the way we get rid of them is by placing cubes over these flags. Once all the flags are covered, the event card goes away. What the chivalry card says is that for every red die that you still have unused in your area, you can take one of your cubes and put it on any one of these cards. You would gain the benefit of getting these cards closer to being defeated, as well as every cube that you put on these cards, the flag represents influence, so you would gain an influence for every cube that you put out there. After you're done activating the card, the dice you use to activate it go away, but your citizen stays there for the rest of the game unless it's displaced somehow. I want to take this opportunity to say that there are basically two kinds of activity cards you can come across. A regular activity card looks like this. There is no little hourglass symbol in the lower right. When you activate this kind of card, something happens immediately. The other kind of activity card are the delayed activity cards. You can tell them by the tiny little hourglass symbol in the lower right-hand corner. When you first activate the card, nothing happens. But then, as the game goes on, the card can affect the rest of gameplay. For example, the card The Recruiter says that you add up the pip value of your red dice and divide by three. So let's just say you're using a single six, you get two activations. That means you get to place two of your cubes on this card. Once you've activated the card and you have these cubes on it, now on a future turn, you can use these cubes as though they are a red die with a pip value of six. So that's pretty powerful. Um, 
Another thing to note of this card, it actually doesn't cost any money to put one of your citizens on it. It'll cost you three influence to put one of your citizens on it. Another option you have in terms of what you want to do with your dice is you can help build the cathedral. The cathedral is up here in the upper right hand part of the board. It always requires a white die to activate it. And you would simply select one of the white dice from your dice pool. In this case, it's a three. You would then take one of your cubes and put it into one of these blank spots above the corresponding die value, in this case, three. What does that get you? Well, it will always garner you one victory point that you can see it printed up here. And it'll also garner you some amount of influence depending on whether you're using a one through three value die or a four through six. If the cube goes over here, it gets you one influence. If the cube were over on this side, it would get you two. Now, when placing these, you always have to start from the bottom and work your way up. So you could not, for example, decide to place the blue cube here. Why is that important? Well, at the end of the game, you'll notice the negative victory points printed over here. Every one of these rows that does not have at least one of your colored cubes in it will cost you two victory points. The next option you have is you can fight off these events directly. You simply consult the cards just the same way you would consult the activity cards. To fight off war, it requires red dice. To fight off the heresy card, it requires white dice. You select a pool of dice, one to three, add up their pit values, divide by this denominator, and that's how many times you can fight that card. Every time you fight it, you put one of your cubes over one of the flags, gaining an influence, and getting you closer to removing that card. Once all of the spaces on the card have been covered, like I've done here, well, then you're going to award victory points here. Now, whoever has the most number of cubes on the card will get the higher number of points, whoever's the second most will get the lower number, and whoever, if there's anyone lower than that, they don't get anything. Now, in the case of a tie, green and blue each have three cubes here, you would add up these points and divide them equally, rounding down. So in this case, both green and blue would receive one victory point. It is possible for there to be neutral cubes on these cards. If there are neutral cubes on the cards, well, they still count toward majorities to deny players having them. So in this case, gray and green are tied, so green would only get one victory point, gray being represented by the neutral or dummy player. Now, after the cubes have been cleared, one player will claim this card. And the player who claims it is, again, the player who had the most amount of um, cubes on the card. In the event of a tie in this case, the player that fought this card first will claim the card, which is why it's always important to place your cubes from the top down, left to right, keeping track of who is in that upper left position, because that's the tiebreaker if you have a tie for how many cubes are on the card in terms of who gets to take the card and keep it for the rest of the game. Why would you want to do that? There are end game scoring conditions that are determined on how many of these cards you've claimed throughout play. So how do we get more citizens into these principal buildings in order to roll more dice? Well, that's another thing you can do on your turn. You can spend dice of the appropriate color to place your citizens into the principal buildings. So every principal building works a little differently, so we'll go through them one by one. If you want to get one of your citizens into the palace here, let's say the blue player really wants one of their citizens in here. Well, they rolled a red four. So they could use that red four to displace whatever citizen is in the four position. Now, when these citizens come out here, they're called displaced citizens, and you leave them here on the board until the end of the round. Reason being that once you have a displaced citizen of your color in that principal building, 
you cannot displace another citizen of that color. So if blue, for example, really wanted to get in on the spot number one here, they could not displace this orange citizen because there's already an orange citizen that is displaced. At the end of every round, when you're short of cleaning up, any displaced citizens will go back to you in your personal supply. You don't have to spend more influence to rehire them. You simply have them again. If you want to get one of your citizens into the bishopric, well, it depends on which die you're using. It has to be a white die. If the die you're using has a pip value of one, three, or five, then the citizen would come in on this top row and sort of slide everybody down, displacing the rightmost citizen. If, however, the pip values were two, four, or six, well, then the citizen would come in on this bottom row, slide everyone down, and displace that citizen. Displacing citizens in the town hall works the same way. You would simply consult the rows here. So in this case, I have a value two. So if orange wanted to, dis to displace someone, they would put them in this second row, finding the two, slide them down, displacing green, and so on. One of the final options you have uh, in terms of what you want to do on your turn with your dice is to use agriculture, which is this space over here. It always requires yellow dice. You divide their pip value by two, and that's how much money you get in terms of activations. Very briefly, if you haven't figured it out already, the actions you can take with the red cards are very military focused and uh, things like fighting the event cards. The actions you can take with the yellow area here, the town hall, are usually about making money, and the actions that you can take uh, at the bishopric are often about helping construct the cathedral as well as giving you some special powers. Now, one of the most interesting things about this game is that you do not have to use your own dice when it's your turn. Yes, you can in fact purchase dice from your opponents or from the dummy player, because every game of Twa will have at least some dummy player dice at the start of the game and dummy player citizens blocking up spaces in the principal buildings. So, when it's your turn, if you want to use another player's die or dice, you are free to buy them. And your opponent cannot refuse that transaction. So, how does that work? Well, let's suppose that the blue player here sees that the green player has a big juicy red number six there, and that would really allow them to do a very powerful red action. So they say they want to buy this die from the green player. No problem. How much do you pay? Well, that's where it gets a little tricky. Again, everyone gets these reference cards, and it's pretty simple. You have to ask yourself, after you've purchased all your dice for this action, how many dice are you going to use to take that action? So for example, you buy this six from the green player and the blue player is now going to use two red dice for their action. Well, the card says if you're using two dice for your action, every die that you purchased cost you four coins. So in this example, the blue player would have to give four coins to the green player. But what if they notice that the dummy player die also has a juicy die up here? They want to buy that as well. You are allowed to. You can buy dice from multiple players, no problem. But now when you're activating the dice, you're activating three dice. So if you're activating three dice, every die that you bought cost six money. So in this example, the blue player would have to pay six money to the green player and six money to the bank representing the dummy player. Of note, you are not permitted, and here's a better look at that card with the various costs, you are not permitted to use influence to manipulate dice that you purchase. You can only use your influence to manipulate your own dice. So keep that in mind before you go buying up a bunch of low value dice from your opponents. Finally, if you don't have any of your own dice left, 
or you just don't want to take any actions, you can pass. Now, what's interesting about passing is, if you pass and there are still dice left anywhere on the city square, whoops. <laughs> so let's say the orange player here says, I pass. Well, immediately you would grab two coins and you get that just for passing, but you put them here in your district. Reason being that every time it goes around, let's say the blue player uses their yellow dice, and then this player uses their white dice, and then you've pat, it comes back around to you again. Well, every time it comes back around to you, you add another $1 to your district. So passing early is a way to get a lot of money but you're also sacrificing a lot of actions to do that. Basically, when you pass, you get two, and every time it comes around to you, as long as there are any dice anywhere, you're gonna get one more. Now this is gonna sound a little weird, but now that you know how to play the game, setting up the game will actually make sense. Because when you set up the game, you designate a start player. I think the rule book says it's whoever last read a history book. Um, but the start player will place one of their citizens anywhere in any principal building that they wish. So maybe they go there. Then the next player in clockwise order will place their citizen anywhere and so on until you've, everybody has placed one citizen. Then the last player places their next citizen and it goes in counterclockwise order uh, until we get back to the start player. Then the start player goes again, and you just keep going back and forth like that until you've placed all your initial citizens in the principal buildings. Any blank spaces that remain after that initial placement will be filled in by the gray dummy player citizens. You would then start the next round. You would start the next round by flipping over the level two activity cards in all three of the principal buildings and you would collect your income and repeat until the game is over. The game is going to end after a predetermined number of rounds based on player count. A few other sort of tidbit rules are that anytime you are supposed to do something and you physically can't, for example, let's say you don't have enough money to pay your citizens when it comes to the income phase, well, Whenever something like that happens, you simply do as much of it as you can, and then you lose two victory points. So that applies for paying your citizens, that applies to uh, you know fending off the black dice that you have to deal with. Anything that you can't fully do, you do as much as you can, and then you just lose two victory points. Another note is that every player will start the game with uh, five money, and then you will get income right away at the start of the first round. After you've finished the final round of play, you'll do endgame scoring. Endgame scoring is basically you add up all of the victory point chits that you've collected along the way, usually acquired by taking actions that are on the activity cards, as well as building the cathedral and fighting off the event cards. You will also gain victory points for any event cards that are still in the game, but not completely defeated. So if you have event cards that are up there with your color token on it, but it is not defeated, every card is worth one point to you. So in this case, both blue and orange would receive one victory point at the end of the game. You would also look at the activity cards. And if your citizens are still on these activity cards, you would gain the amount of victory points that they're covering. This reminds me, if there are already two citizens on an activity card, but you really wanna take that action, you absolutely can place a citizen there. It still costs you the printed amount of money, and you would simply put your citizen up here on the card. You can now activate the card just as well as the other players can, but uh, you just don't get any victory points for having that citizen there at the end of the game. 
Additional endgame scoring is you would consult the cathedral and see how many rows did you not help build. Every row that you don't have a cube in, you lose two victory points. And then finally, the big reveal, everyone will reveal what their character card says the endgame scoring conditions are. Those endgame scoring conditions would apply to all players. You add up the victory points, and whoever has the most victory points is the winner. Well, that's everything you need to know to play the game Twa. Uh, please let me know if I made any mistakes or goofs in the comments. I'll do my best to correct them. Uh, also, this is a reposting of an older video I made. The older video was much lower resolution, much lower quality. Hopefully this one's better. Let me know what you think about that. If you have any requests or anything, uh, put those in the comments as well. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching and have fun at game night.